Well, good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see you guys in spite of the rain. My name is Micaela, and I'm the uh, Discipleship and Student Ministry Director here, and I'm thankful to be with you guys today. As I was, um, you know, preparing and also procrastinating through message preparation, um, as a true child of social media, I was on Twitter, and uh, there's a couple of different accounts, and, and they their sole purpose is to be a little bit tongue-in-cheek about ministry life and the things that we as ministers and sometimes you guys as people of God deal with or are familiar with when it comes to ministry. And so um, I've got a couple of pictures. I took a few screenshots because they, they kind of made me chuckle a little bit because there are a couple of things in the Christian world that we say that make sense here in our context, but outside of our realm, they don't necessarily seem all that sensical. So this one particular uh, Twitter account, his, uh, his sole purpose is to be tongue-in-cheek about worship ministry, and so he posted this. He said, if you say things such as, do life together, or do community, or add another tool to your tool belt, or let's unpack this, you probably shouldn't say it. <laughs> and it made me chuckle because it's one of those things where we say these things as a church body and as people, um, but outside of that, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so people started responding to his uh, initial post, and they were adding to that list of things that people say that are just a little bit strange. Like this one guy said, how about let us love on you? I mean, where outside of church does that sound normal? Love on you? What does that even mean? But in church world, we're like, yes, let us love on you as Christians and believers. And then somebody else added this one. Let's camp out right here. And we know that when the pastor says, let's camp out right here, we know he's not getting to his next point for quite some time. So we might as well get a little bit comfortable in those pews. And then there was another one where somebody said, um, they said, I think in the season we are in, and that's such a churchy term. That was something that my mom used to say. She used to say, baby, it's only a season. And I feel like in church world, we're constantly talking about these seasons. Well, right now, God has me in this season of trial right now. But outside of church, we don't really say what season we're in unless we're talking about fall, winter, or spring. But we're talking about seasons of the soul. It's a very churchy thing. And then somebody else responded with, let's lean in. And whenever the pastor says, let's lean in, that means she's also going to take a little while to get to her next point, so you might as well stay comfortable. And then somebody else responded to that, and they said, intentionally. That's such a churchy word sometimes. We talk about how intentionally we have to do things in the body of Christ. And so we talk about those things, and, and we understand that there are a few things in the world that we say that are just a little bit strange. And so the, the last one is a Twitter account that I'm particularly fond of, because this one is the tongue-in-cheek youth minister. And so we have a few similarities. And so his whole thing was to try to fit as many of those in one sentence as possible. So he says, how about the people that somehow use all of these cliches in one sentence. Let me unpack why I love this community of believers because we just do life together. And when all of us are on the same page, it just totally adds another tool to our tool belt as followers of Christ. <laughs> we all have those certain things that we say as believers that seem just a little bit weirder, or these buzzwords that only exist um, in the context that we use them in the church world. And so I say all that to say that as we're in this series on community and we're talking through that with Pastor Jeff and myself in this sermon series, there are going to be a couple of times that we use those buzzwords, but fear not, hang with me. I promise that we will work through why those words actually do fit into the context here in our church. So hang tight and we'll get through that. Don't tune me out when I start using some of those buzzwords, okay? So today we're actually going to, uh, to dig into a couple of different verses, because what we're going to do is look at the example that Christ Jesus has set for us 
in regards to being in community with people. So his community might be one of the most famous community groups that we know of because it's such a popular example. Now, we all know that Jesus had this group of men that he surrounded himself with and he ministered with and they were known as the disciples. And so we're going to read a little bit about how they came to be. So we'll start off in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. It says this, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John. They were in a boat with their father, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So here we have two sets of brothers, and what I like about this uh, the scripture reference is they immediately and at once followed Jesus when he called them. I mean, this one set of brothers, they left poor old dad in the boat. They were like, we're out of here. we got to follow this Jesus guy. So this was something that was very important to them because they understood the significance of Jesus calling them. Now, in the book of Mark, chapter 2, we can read on and see who else was called. It says, once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. I guess Jesus liked the water. I mean, we can relate to that here in Stewart. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. So here we see this tax collector who Jesus called, and, and right away he followed him. And not only that, but they, they followed Jesus, and then they proceeded to have a meal together. They sat down and ate together. And then in the book of John, chapter 1, we read this. It says, The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So here we see Jesus, and he's going around to all of these different places, and he's calling people to him. And what I like about this reference is that when he calls Philip, Philip responds and answers the call. But not only that, he went and got Nathaniel, and he said, Nathaniel, you got to come with me. We found Jesus, the one whom we've been waiting for. And so they went and followed Jesus. So Jesus is going around and he's, he's really inviting all of these people to follow him. And he had all of these different crowds. It says in the scripture that there were many that followed him. But as we continue to read and study, we understand that there was one day where Jesus kind of whittled it down to the few that we're most familiar with, the 12 apostles. And so in Luke chapter 6, verse 12, it reads this. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. So there was Simon, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, and Judas, the traitor. So I was thinking about this. I was thinking about Jesus and, and all the followers that he had and, and then the disciples that he whittled down to just the few that he was going to minister to and do life with. That's one of those terms that we talked about. And so as I was thinking about that, it reminded me of one of my favorite movies of all time. Now, you're probably familiar with it because it came out in the 1980s, and it's this movie that's about a brain, an athlete, a basket case, a princess, and a criminal. The Breakfast Club. I love that movie. Now, back um, when I was growing up, I wasn't as familiar with these movies, and I had a coworker from Fort Lauderdale find that out, and she was appalled. And she was like, wait a minute, so you don't know anything about the Brat Pack? You don't know anything about all those movies that came out in the 80s? And I was like, listen, I kind of came along at the tail end of the whole 80s thing, so I wasn't really familiar with it, and I grew up kind of 
was sheltered, and so my mom and dad were like, you can't watch that, you're not allowed to do that. So there's a few things that I need to catch up on. And so she made sure that I caught up on all these 80s films. And I was grateful because it felt like there was a light bulb that came on because all of a sudden all these references that were being made in television shows, they all made sense because they were all referencing these 80s movies. And I was particularly grateful because The Breakfast Club ended up being one of my most favorite films. And when I think about this movie, the thing I like about it is, um, is the way that it depicts the characters that are in this film. Now, I'm going to try not to give out any spoilers, but honestly, if you haven't seen it, it's from the 1980s. You guys got to catch up, just like I did, so stay with me here. But at the beginning of this movie, it opens with this montage, and it's introducing us to the characters in the film. And so it starts off, and you see the stereotypical princess as she's getting dropped off by her father. And they take time in this little scene to depict that her father and her have this relationship where he seems to be very detached from his relationship with her. He provides her with material things in hopes that that will equate to love in their relationship. That's how he kind of buys her affection. So we see her get dropped off, and they're all coming to detention on a Saturday. So the next person that gets dropped off is the quote-unquote brain, the one who's supposed to be Mr. Know-it-all and Smarty Pants. And so he gets dropped off by his mother, and she's very overbearing, and she's, she's getting on to him about his grades and his academics and telling him that it's unacceptable to have grades lower than a certain level, and you can see the pressure that he's having to deal with. And then the next person we see get dropped off is the athlete. And so he's dropped off by his dad, who's this very macho character, and he's putting pressure on him, saying, you need to perform well in this arena that you're in, in the sports that you're doing, because that's the only way you're going to succeed in life. And so he's making this child see that his whole future is riding on everything that he does on that wrestling mat. And so as we see that, we start to see the criminal of the group walking up towards the school. And so everybody else had gotten dropped off in a car, but what we understand as this criminal comes walking up is that he doesn't have anybody in his life to drop him off to school. So we understand that his life is a little bit different than the people in the rest of the movie. He's, he's got some struggles and his home life isn't very good. So as he enters the scene, then the last person gets dropped off, and this is who we come to know as the basket case. And so she exits her vehicle, and it's as if the people who were dropping her off didn't even realize that she was outside of the car already. They weren't paying any attention to her, and so from that we can understand that she is seen, or really, invisible in the life that she leads. And so this this visual of all of these people getting dropped off for coming to this Saturday detention, it made me think a little bit because they're all coming to this place for one person or for one purpose, and that purpose is Saturday detention. Now, thankfully, when Jesus was calling his disciples, they didn't go to detention. Life was a little bit better for them. But what made me think about the parallel is that you've got this group of people that are going to have to do life together. And this group of people that's depicted in the movie, they're normal people just like us. They're people who have to deal with being seen on the outside as one thing, but under the surface they have all of these different things going on, just like myself and just like you. And the great thing about this movie is it depicts this, this deep need that we all have for being in community, to be loved and accepted by other people. It's a common theme. And so this movie showcases the way these students and these characters end up having to build community with each other after having been in this seven-hour detention all day on a Saturday. So as the movie progresses, it gets to the point where they all kind of sit down in a circle and they've spent the entire day together. So they've fought and argued and they've vented and they've cried and they've shared secrets and they've told each other all of these different things. So at this point, all of their walls are down, the boundaries are gone, and everything has just gotten real. So they're sitting there in this circle, and they finally have these moments of real conversation where all of the perspectives and all the stereotypes are completely gone, and everything is authentic. 
And, and in this scene, this is my favorite quote from the movie because one of the kids says, well, we've all talked out all of these different things. And then he says this brave line. He says, what's going to happen to us on Monday? Because here's the thing, after they've let their guard down and after they've gone through all of this, these different things, these kids that are sitting there, they still have to grapple with the fact that come Monday, their real lives are still there. Even though they're coming from all these different backgrounds and dealing with all these different issues, come Monday, they're going to have to figure out what they do from there because now they've built this bond together and they have to figure out how are we going to handle this. And the thing that I like about this movie is it doesn't necessarily resolve this for the viewer. We don't get to see what these kids do when they get to school on Monday morning after sharing all of these secrets and after really relating to one another. We don't know what happens. But it made me think, too, that that's exactly how life is for us. And that's how it was for the disciples because the disciples were coming from all walks of life as well. The disciples, we had fishermen and we had tax collectors and we had people who had things that they were dealing with and, and all of the things that they had to go through, but they had to work together to do this ministry with Jesus. And so that's when we see that what Jesus did was one of the buzzwords. He did intentional ministry. And we see that because as the disciples traveled with Jesus and as they continued to learn and grow together, we saw that Jesus, he would do these large group meetings where he would teach to hundreds and thousands of people. But after that, he would get down with his few and that is where they would hash out life together. That's where they would figure out all those different things. And so if we are to follow Christ's example, if we are to truly make sure that we're mimicking the things that he does, then that means that just like Jesus got down with his few, the disciples, we also have to do that with our peers. That means we have to make sure that we as people have close friends and we have mentors and people that we're mentoring and we have people that keep our secrets and, and people to share meals with just like Jesus did. <laughs> 